Right. Well, it's 1715, uh, everybody. Um, thanks for, for attending. Welcome. Welcome to the Lawton Naval Unit uh, in the Department of War Studies. Uh, welcome to the School of Security Studies and welcome to King's College London. All of us make up your hosts uh, for tonight. Welcome to the latest of the British Commission for Maritime History, King's Maritime History Seminars that are supported by the Society for Nautical Research uh, and Lloyd's Register. And I should say too, uh, welcome to Corbett 100, um, a project that's uh, launched to mark the centenary in uh, 2022, I guess, of the death of uh, naval historian and strategist Sir Julian Corbett. So, Watch this space uh, for plenty of conferences and publications and events and so forth. This is a project, a collaborative uh, affair between uh, Kings, between Lawton at Kings and the Hattendorf Center uh, of the US Naval uh, War College. And there may well be a chance uh, to ask some questions about that because we happen to have uh, online, he's not showing his face, but James Smith. Uh, with us uh, from uh, from King's, uh, whose initiative it is, as far as I'm aware. And of course, we have our speaker tonight, uh, who is David Conan, the director himself of the John B. Hattendorf Center for Maritime Historical Research at the US Naval War College. Now, David's a distinguished uh, naval historian, as I'm sure you all know. He's written extensively uh, on, on, on naval history. He also has had a really exciting career, a service career uh, in, the, in the US Navy. He's also a graduate uh, of King's, uh, where he did his uh, PhD. So he weighs the professional and the academic perspectives that we've always valued and which will be celebrated, I think, as part of the uh, Corbett 100 uh, project, uh, and I suppose he's better placed uh, than many, probably better placed than any, uh, to discuss uh, historical influences on contemporary debates uh, and, uh, and strategy. So it is with uh, particular pleasure uh, that I welcome uh, David back, uh, who's going to speak to us uh, all the way from the United States uh, in our new uh, global uh, format, uh, interrupting his lunchtime, I, su I suppose, uh, about uh, British influence uh, on American naval thinking. And I'll just remind everybody to uh, put any questions that you have into the Q&A uh, rather than to the chat, and we'll try to, I'll try to read those out at the end. Otherwise, it's over to you, David. Uh, many, many thanks. Well, thank you very much, Alan. It's it's such a privilege to be able to address this great audience. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a bit strange on my end because I can't see anybody. So it's um, a lot more like the Apollo missions, I think, of the 60s for my side of it. Um, I'm the founding director of the Hattendorf Center. Recently, I've been uh, uh, sort of taken out of the, the administrivia which is great, you know, all of us who write history prefer not to do administrivia. So now I'm the Tracy Kittredge um, uh, Scholar for Maritime History and War Studies at the Naval War College in the Hattendorf Center. So we're making a lot of progress uh, on multiple levels, uh, getting the, the organization together. Uh, the purpose of the organization is, is that I'm part of at the Naval War College is right in line with what uh, Stephen B. Luce and others at the very beginning of our institution were all about. Um, I always like to start my presentations on the beach uh, because who doesn't like to be on the beach? Um, and what you see here is an image from 1944 of U.S. naval uh, sailors uh, on a place called Mogmog Island out in the middle of the Pacific. And you can see in the background the big fleet um, and a bunch of aircraft carriers. What I think is striking about this is it's 1944, Pearl Harbor happened in 41, and within that very brief amount of time, the United States was able to build that fleet. Those carriers that are out on the horizon were not constructed when Pearl Harbor happened. And that just, to me, it illustrates so many different levels of uh, point from a historical perspective as to why we should study history. And of course, uh, being American, um, one day as I, as I was walking around London, 
I noticed there was a statue of, of a guy named George Washington who stood up against the crown uh, famously, and he's looking up to Nelson, which I found to be uh, sort of striking as you know somebody who speaks with this type of accent. I wonder, you know, why is George Washington in the middle of Trafalgar Square looking up at, at Nelson? And to me, this juxtaposition illustrates a bigger point about the transatlantic relationship in broader terms. Of course, the statue was put there in the 1920s. Um, the state of Virginia actually shipped over uh, dirt to put uh, into the ground uh, where they put the statue up. Uh, because at one point George Washington said, I shall never step foot on British soil again. So just to keep that all together, they, uh, they went ahead and shipped dirt over as well when they put the statue up. Uh, but I just find these types of things very interesting. You know, the, the core of the story really hinges upon uh, a group of uh, US Naval officers who came up in that immediate post-Civil War period and into the early uh, 20th century, the first 50 years of the 20th century. And they deeply were affected by the experiences of two world wars and into a Cold War era. And so today's presentation is primarily built upon the premise that these officers, who we all probably know, uh, at least we do in the United States in general terms, uh, studied their, pract their, their, their profession by examining history. And Ernest King, for example, on the far left, uh, was, was a student of history in his own right. And he, he wrote a great deal um, about history. He knew all of Napoleon's marshals. He wanted to be a lot like Sir Jer Jervis, the, the British Admiral. So this image of King as an Anglo phobe is, is actually a myth. He, he was very much uh, part of the British tradition in the way he looked at the world. Chester Nimitz, obviously is someone who we all know. Bill Halsey, not Bull, uh, is also someone who spent a lot of time studying history, primarily because that was the emphasis uh, that was placed on the curriculum at Naval War College here in Newport, Rhode Island. Now, in the late 19th century, there was this idea of imperial federation. And a lot of this is coming out of Britain and the idea of imperial federation was seen by the Americans as sort of, uh, is this a trick? I mean, what, are we part of the imperial federation since we speak English? Um, and there's a dialogue that takes place after the American Civil War about the question of uh, how the United States fits in to the global uh, system that existed in the late 19th century. And what we'll see today is some of that uh, dialogue unfold in the presentation. But the idea of imperial federation is something that is quite interesting. And a, a good friend of mine named Leo, Louis Halewood is actually doing a lot of work on this. And uh, so watch out for that, because I think he's going to produce something very useful. Now, the Americans showed up in the First World War, as we all know, uh, with all these ideas about League of Nations and all that sort of thing. And you know, it didn't really f work out. Um, because of course Congress didn't pass the legislation and so the Americans didn't really show up. But the British went ahead with it and um, you can see this map. I, I, I like maps just so we know. Uh, it tells so many different stories. They went ahead with the League of Nations and of course the empire is, is the basis for uh, a lot of how the League of Nations was trying to be put together in that period of the 1920s and 30s. Now, this map is of the British Empire from a military perspective in 1939. And we see all very clean uh, lines between uh, Royal Navy commands, so very oceanic in focus. But then those red dots on the, on the map show land bases. And one of the things that the United States Navy sort of learned from their experience of working with the British during the First World War was that the Royal Navy was overly tied to the pier. I'm using terminology that Ernest King used when he wrote about it. Uh, the Royal Navy was, was uh, stuck at the pier side because they had to defend these bases around the world. And so King started writing about logistics in the 1920s uh, 
and into the 1930s and, and trying to envision a time when we could operate without access to bases. And these are ideas that are still uh, being batted about in naval circles, uh, at least here in the United States, um, trying to get uh, untied to the pier, so to speak. Now, of course, after the Second World War, the idea of a United Nations was what the United States was really pushing. Winston Churchill was a little bit skeptical of this idea and for probably very good reason. But at the end of the Second World War, what we had was what Franklin Roosevelt really wanted to achieve. And that is a world under a United Nations with a four policemen type of setup. And of course, China and Russia are part of the four policemen as, as Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt used to talk about. Uh, and he's getting these ideas from all kinds of different places, but one of the places that Roosevelt is sort of picking up on these ideas is right out of here in Newport, Rhode Island at the Naval War College. So there was a brief shining moment when the world sort of seemed to be uni unified after the Second World War under this new idea of United Nations. And we can't forget that the history of the British Empire is sort of at the basis of this whole utopian dream because of course, by the 1950s, it's a bipolar world and it's Cold War. Um, I don't really like to use the word Cold War because uh, if you look throughout the longer spans of history, um, basically peace is sort of like Cold War. <laughs> so um, here's how we look at the world today. Um, I find it interesting, at least from a de defense point of view, this is how the United States has sort of carved up the world. And I think the interesting point about looking at maps like this is that you can make some juxtapositions as to how uh, people used to look at the world uh, in their own time. Uh, today, the United States Navy and Joint Services are trying to sort of figure out how do we, how do we keep this together? Um, and part of the dialogue that we're trying to have is how do we keep this together while operating as part of a global coalition, when at the same time we all have common uh, rivals is the best term. Um, how do we work with those rivals so that we can avoid wars? Uh, how do we uh, prepare for the surprise if a, a rival decides to attack us? And those are the types of discussions that are happening today, but of course that's nothing new. This is, this is the ongoing dialogue uh, of strategic uh, maritime power. It's the ongoing dialogue of military versus naval. And I look forward to answering questions about that. So with all that as sort of a preface, uh, this all sort of starts from an American perspective after the American Civil War. Uh, it's, it's too detailed to get into the pre-Civil War mentality of the United States. We all know about the Monroe Doctrine, which in 1823, President Monroe said, why did you burn out our, our White House down? We weren't really trying to hurt anybody. And of course the British came and, and renovated the White House for us uh, and took the China with them. So the Monroe Doctrine was designed to say, please don't invade us, but we do reserve the right to defend our interests on the global stage. The Civil War happened in the 1860s. And of course the people who participated in that war uh, came out of that experience with, with a lot of questions in their mind. Uh, the gentleman on the left is Emory Upton. He's an army guy who became a hero in the Civil War, and he went around the world to study the, the military organizations of Europe, and he was particularly taken by the German system. And Upton came home and met with uh, the guy on the right, uh, Stephen B. Luce, who was the skipper of the USS Hartford when Emory Upton was the commander of the artillery school at Fort Monroe, Virginia. And they were having dinner on board the Hartford and Upton told Luce, you know, I, I went to Germany and I saw that they have this thing called the Kriegs Academy. It's very interesting. Uh, they're doing some interesting things with uh, history and they're, they're trying to figure out ways to apply it. And I think we should have a, a Kriegs Academy too, which for those of you who don't speak German, it's the War College. And Luce thought that was a pretty interesting idea. And this idea was, you know, sort of batted around in his mind and he recognized that professional education was critical for practitioners, not just naval, but also military to learn their, their profession. And this is all happening, of course, during the post-Civil War reconstruction period, 
into the Gilded Age. And so what you see Stephen Luce doing is trying to come up with new ways of educating sailors how to practice their trade in a more efficient way. And of course, this is also part and parcel to the transition from sail to, to steam. So you have coal-fired ships with big guns and that sort of thing, and sailors going on board without sufficient training to operate within these machines. And so Stephen Luce was really pushing for educational reform in the late 19th century. And um, so he was reaching out to scholars both within the United States and around the world. And of course, that is the connection. Uh, John Knox Lawton also was teaching uh, about history, the applied methods, the, the importance of education uh, as a professor at King's College London. And Stephen B. Luce and John Knox Lawton developed this you know, ongoing correspondence about the issues of professionalization, the role of history, uh, visions of the future. And Lawton and Luce really became very close in their correspondence. And of course, Professor Lambert, Andrew Lambert has written about this extensively. So nothing I'm saying is original. Uh, I've, I've read it in a very good book uh, written by Andrew Lambert, which I highly recommend. And what, what this all means is we're still having this conversation today here at the Naval War College. The same conversations that were going on between Lawton and Luce uh, in the late 19th century into the 20th century are still the ongoing conversation. So the role of history is still with us. Uh, I, I'm mentioning Fred T. Jane because it was very popular in that era to play around with toys and they referred to him as toys to come up with new ways of using ships and deploying uh, warships without av actually having to go to sea. And the idea of wargaming, of course, was nothing new, but Fred T. Jane had an influence on what we were ultimately doing here in Newport at the Naval War College. So I'm, I'm covering a lot of ground very quickly, but just to summarize, by putting together uh, ideas from Britain, from John Knox Lawton, uh, Fred T. Jane and others, and looking at history with an applied approach. So the Battle of Trafalgar, for example, uh, Horatio Nelson, his, his uh, style of leadership. Uh, those are things that are all being discussed here in Newport uh, at the Naval War College. And this, this is an image on the, on the far right of the Naval War College in its early days, uh, 1884 or so. Uh, the image uh, to the sort of center left is uh, taken from a, a, a Leslie's of the period. It's, I think, the earliest image of activity here at the Naval War College. But what you can see uh, is Mahan sitting at the chair, uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan, listening to an officer briefing about a battle. And it looks like a Civil War battle on the map, to be honest. I think it might be Savannah. Uh, but they were studying Trafalgar, then they would look at Civil War battles, and then they would start to, to have discussions about well, what if we had uh, other types of weapons? How, how, could, how could we use uh, army forces to support naval activity and vice versa? And they, they start having those discussions and they write papers about it. And, and that's the education that enabled the United States Navy to start thinking about joining uh, the, the bigger navies of the world in, in the global maritime arena. This is another early image of the Naval War College. Uh, it's 1894. And the one thing that I always like to point out about this image, if you look at the gentleman on the white, in the white uniform, uh, they're doing a war game, as you can see. Uh, the gentleman in the white uniform is actually wearing a Royal Navy uniform. He's British. And there's a couple of gentlemen in the, in the back who are either Chinese or Japanese. They probably Chinese be, based upon the caps that they have. So as Luce intended, Stephen B. Luce, the Naval War College always was a place for discussion about the global maritime arena. It's an international forum. It's not just an American war college. It was meant to be an international forum for the advancement of strategic thought in the global maritime arena. Uh, before I move on, I would also hasten to point out that the gentleman that the British guy is talking to is wearing a US Army uniform. 
So it's not just combined discussions, to use the British term for multinational, uh, it's also joint discussion among, among joint services. So this is the type of dialogue that started to really come together in the late 19th century, uh, which started to influence visions of American sea power uh, in the late 19th century. And of course, history is a, a major part of that discussion. And so when Stephen Luce was putting together the, the staff at the Naval War College, he made arrangements to have uh, Professor James R. Soley appointed. Uh, he was literally commissioned into the ranks of the US Navy with the rank, not the position, but the rank of Professor USN. Uh, that existed, that concept existed into the 1930s, by the way. So it was a naval rank in the US Navy, uh, the, the term professor. And of course, if you were a, a junior professor, you would carry the equivalency of a lieutenant commander, uh, a mid-grade professor, you're a commander. And in, in Soli's case, he's carrying the equivalency of a, of a Navy captain. So it's a pretty interesting idea. We all know who Teddy Roosevelt is, I suspect. Um, he's a very interesting character and we could probably spend the rest of the conversation uh, about this gentleman. But uh, Teddy Roosevelt is also a historian in his own right. Of course, his uncle is a former Confederate who set up uh, headquarters in Liverpool, uh, which is a great Navy town, I know. And uh, one day when I was going around to see all the sites for the Beatles, you know, the, the Cavern Club and all that, I, I saw a building that had the marker that said, this is the headquarters of the Confederate States Navy. And sure enough, James Bullock, who is the uncle of Theodore Roosevelt, had a huge influence upon Theodore Roosevelt's view of how navies could work. And James Bullock was the Confederate who operated from Liverpool. And of course, he never came home. He stayed in England. Uh, better place to be, I guess. Um, and the interesting thing about uh, how Teddy Roosevelt took those sea stories from his uncle, he actually took it back to the War of 1812. And he really kind of created a lot of mythology about uh, American successes in the War of 1812. That being said, his history of the War of 1812 still looms as among one of the better histories of that particular war. Um, not to give another shout out to Andrew, but he also wrote a very good book about the War of 1812 uh, called The Challenge, which I highly recommend as well. Okay, so I've covered a lot of ground very quickly. Uh, we've gotten through the 19th century. I made mention of the Monroe Doctrine. And when Teddy Roosevelt became president, he said, you know, the Monroe Doctrine is just too constraining. So he came up with the Roosevelt Corollary. What the Roosevelt Corollary was all about, 1904-1905 timeframe, is Roosevelt declaring that the United States was going to be part of the global community of naval powers. So rather than a military power, Roosevelt said, we are a naval power. He gave a speech called Our Navy, comma, the peacemaker. Uh, his idea about using Navy is is part and parcel to efforts to use strength to avoid future wars. So our Navy, the peacemaker, uh, is, is a really important idea. A lot of times we talk about the big stick policy, but really it's, it's better uh, described as, as Roosevelt did, which is our Navy, the peacemaker. Now there's a double meaning to the word peacemaker. The double meaning is that at the time that Roosevelt was writing things like this, there was a very popular Colt 45 pistol called the Peacemaker. So when Roosevelt is talking about our Navy, the Peacemaker, he's talking about it in very sort of aggressive terms, but his point is we're trying to use naval power not to have wars. Uh, so it's, there's double meanings in all of this. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt came to the Naval War College quite often and of course, there's the Loose Hall, it's the building named after Stephen B. Loose, but those are the steps that Teddy Roosevelt famously stood on. So if you ever get to Newport, you have to go stand on those steps and get a picture like that. Uh, we all do here in Newport. Uh, but Teddy Roosevelt would come to the Naval War College quite often. And in 1908, 
he came to the Naval War College and there was a big debate between the younger officers and the more senior officers who were sort of steeped in the older traditions of coal and multiple caliber guns. Younger officers were saying, no, we have to have oil fired ships with single caliber guns. And so in 1908, Teddy Roosevelt came to the Naval War College and they had this big debate in a, a room called the General Boardroom, which we still hear at the college. And Roosevelt famously sat there and just listened to all the different arguments. And as he was walking out the door, he said, I'm not gonna make any decisions here today. Uh, but as he's walking out the door, uh, he, he told his aide, uh, Lieutenant Commander Sims, William S. Sims, you know, I, I think we're probably gonna go with oil. Now, this is a major decision in the sense that by shifting to oil, uh, you're, you're adopting a, a system of technology that you really don't know how to use all that well. And of course, coal is still kind of new too, but uh, we actually had developed procedures to use coal. So it's a radical decision that gets made here in Newport to shift to oil uh, almost overnight uh, in 1908. Of course, it takes 10 more years uh, for the US Navy to actually start building battleships uh, oil powered. So the destroyer squadrons served as our, our test bed for uh, ideas in how to use oil fired ships. So Alfred Thayer Mahan, Stephen B. Luce, Teddy Roosevelt, they're all sort of fixtures uh, in the early years of the Naval War College. And they're drawing a lot of their inspiration from Britain and the traditions of Britannia. Uh, not necessarily the history, but the traditions of Britannia. And Alfred Thayer Mahan is inspired, of course, by the example provided by, by Nelson. And he writes extensively about Nelson and the Battle of Trafalgar. And it's part of the curriculum here at the Naval War College, studies of Nelson's leadership, his tactics, and his ability to communicate in an era before wireless, how to write an order clearly to tell a subordinate what you want to do. Sorry to do this to you. This is always better uh, at Halloween time. But the idea of Nelson loomed very, very large. And so Teddy Roosevelt in 1904 sent a team of archeologists over to Paris to find an American Nelson. And he chose John Paul Jones to serve as the American equivalent to Horatio Nelson. So they went to Paris and they found a body and they compared it to a bust that was rendered in John Paul Jones's time by Houdon, the French artist. And they compared the, the mummy uh, against the bust and they said, that's him. And so they brought uh, poor old Pierre or John Paul Jones or whoever he might be uh, back to the United States. And they actually set him up quite nicely at the United States Naval Academy in a crypt that is uh, fashioned after the crypt of none other than the immortal memory of Horatio Nelson. And so what you see here in multiple different ways is Americans really embracing uh, British traditions of sea power and also at the same time coming up with practical means for applying historical lessons of the past in framing future strategy. Mind you, the United States Navy is maybe fifth or sixth on the scale of navies in the, in the world at that time. And so what the US Navy is doing is they're really trying to carve out a vision for the future of American sea power. And whether it's part of a, a British coalition or not, the United States wanted to assert itself in the global American uh, uh, maritime arena. We all sort of know about Alfred Thayer Mahan, and he's probably one of the most famous uh, authors on the question of sea power. He's definitely a naval officer. He is not a historian. And when we read his works, we always have to remember that Mahan is writing for practitioners primarily, not for historians. Now he did adopt some sort of historical uh, ideas from other people. He was very good at taking other people's ideas and putting them together in, in narratives that flowed uh, for the time uh, but the one thing I would say about Mahan is he is not really all that much of an original thinker uh, from a historical perspective. He's definitely a practitioner using history uh, to educate American naval practitioners how they should be.
uh, types of naval officers are, are studies in different personality traits of naval officers. Of course, uh, Nelson's part of that discussion, but also um, others uh, are, are examined by Mahan. Uh, French admirals, others are, are used to look at different types of personalities who are successful in uh, operations at sea in, in the past. Uh, the Problem of Asia is probably one of the better books uh, from, from a contemporary standpoint in that he identifies some very interesting ideas about the role of Asia in global affairs in that work. And of course, he's writing uh, right about the turn of the century about these types of issues. <clears throat> when I'm teaching this here at the Naval War College, I always like to bring out some important passages from his most famous book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. Uh, Conditions and weapons change, but to cope with one or successfully wield others, respect must be had for those consistent teachings of history. Uh, I mean, he could have written that yesterday. Uh, he's saying basically that technology is the variable, but history shows that human beings are essentially the same. He goes on, page 11, nevertheless, a vague feeling of contempt for the past. Again, I think he probably could have written this yesterday. Uh, these are ideas that still resonate, uh, I think, in the contemporary context. Mahan writes in his memoir of service from sail to steam. He was asked, you know, are, are you an imperialist? And he responded. He said, well, I'm an imperialist, but only in the sense that I'm not an isolationist. So, you know, when we think about that idea a little bit, you have to think about what he's trying to say. The Monroe Doctrine is too constraining. Theodore Roosevelt's uh, Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine opens up the idea that the United States can be part of this global maritime community of nations. And Mahan is saying that we can't afford to be isolationist. We have to be part of this globe and we can't just say America first. We have to be part of uh, the, the dialogue uh, around the world. Now, another thing that I'll point out, you know, just because I, I feel like this is kind of fun because I've been, I, personally, I'm, I'm a Navy guy, retired, but I've been to landlocked countries a lot of times uh, as an American Naval officer. And one of the landlocked, essentially landlocked countries I went to is Iraq. I mean, there's just a little sliver of, uh, 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 access to the sea, uh, which is what caused all the problems recently. Uh, Mahan wrote about that, that area of the world. And what's interesting is in 1904, uh, the Persian Gulf and international relations, he writes, the Middle East, if I may adopt a term I have not seen. Now, Mahan claims that he created the term Middle East because the British at the time we're using Near East and Far East, and of course there was India in the middle. Um, so Mahan claims that he came up with this idea of the quote Middle East, uh, whether that's true or not, somebody I'm sure can correct me if I'm wrong, but Mahan certainly made the claim. Mahan is definitely an internationalist. He's, he's thinking about what's going on in the global stage. And there's a very obscure pamphlet that's written in 1910 uh, just for a penny for the Daily Mail. And he talks about the coming war. He says that the, the arms race that's going on in Europe, the ongoing tensions in the Pacific uh, with Japan uh, rising very, very quickly as a naval power, and the ambiguity about what the United States wants to be, we need to, we need to have an open dialogue about where we're going in the world. And he, he publishes this in 1910. And if you do read the text, it's very prophetic. Uh, of course, we know just four years later, the First World War happens. Uh, the Love Feast. This is one of my favorites because uh, as someone who has come to London a couple of times, I've gone to these places. And what's interesting is when President Roosevelt came out of office in 1910, they celebrated Roosevelt for his administration. He went to London and they gave him a great dinner and celebrated Teddy Roosevelt. And they said, you know, you're just a great president and we're sorry that you're not in office anymore. And we hope that Taft does a good job. And Teddy Roosevelt said, well, he'll probably do okay. And um, he came to London and had a great time. Uh, that was in May of 1910 at Guildhall. Uh, 
Now, his protege is a guy named William S. Sims. And before he left office, he gave Sims command of a battleship called the Minnesota. And this is actually a portrait of, of Teddy Roosevelt that he gave to Sims, to Commander Sims, you know, thank you for, for doing such a good job. Now, the fact is, battleship commands are reserved for captains, 06. Sims at the time was a commander in 05. So, you know, he's, he's too junior in rank, really, to have command of a battleship in the U.S. Navy of the period. So his appointment to command a battleship was pretty controversial uh, within the ranks of the U.S. Navy. But Sims is one of these movers and shakers. He's an up-and-comer. He's sort of referred to as a young Turk, uh, somebody who is willing to challenge the system. And in 1905, as the inspector of gunnery, working for Teddy Roosevelt. He went over to London and his friend, John Jellicoe, who he knew since uh, their days together in the Asiatic, uh, John Jellicoe showed him the uh, HMS Dreadnought at Christmas time, 1905. So Sims is part of this decision to, sh to shift uh, design of American warships and it's inspired by what's going on uh, in, in the Royal Navy and these personal connections, I, I can't stress enough, are very important to the development of the global uh, relationship that evolves over time. 1910, uh, the Atlantic Fleet goes over and does gunnery exercises uh, in the North Sea with the Royal Navy. As they're sailing from the North Sea along the North German coast, the United States warships had their battle flags flying and they didn't pull into port. And so they did pull into Gravesend and they went up to London and had a great uh, dinner at Guild Hall. This is just a couple months after the Teddy Roosevelt uh, visit at Guild Hall. And these are, this is the menu from the Guild Hall dinner uh, from 1910. And that's Commander Sims's uh, place setting from Guild Hall, which are in the Library of Congress actually. And um, Sims obviously enjoyed himself all the junior officers are sitting there with him at the table. Uh, none other than Ernest King was sitting at the table uh, next door to Sims. And Sims gets up and offers a speech. And he says, if ever a time comes when the British em Empire is ever menaced by an external enemy, you can, in my opinion, uh, count on every American man to defend your empire to the last drop of blood. That was pretty controversial because as a commander, uh, he just made American policy and the Kaiser wasn't too pleased about that, nor was the Japanese emperor. And uh, that created a huge controversy called the Guild Hall uh, controversy. And in the New York Times, they referred to it, as you can see from the headline, uh, that um, they referred to it as the love feast, the London love feast. Uh, so, you know, what do you do with a guy that, sort of exceeds his uh, rank and influence, send him to the Naval War College. <laughs> so Sims gets removed from command in the Minnesota and he's sent to the Naval War College where he learns that by looking at the past, by applying the, the, the historical methodology that Luce and Mahan were really pushing for, you could actually do some things with history in applied way to come up with new ways to use Naval forces. And he writes about it while he's here. He's here for the, the first time. Um, he, he thought his career was over. And you know he's assigned to the Naval War College for a three year period, which is the long course. And it was essentially designed for guys like Sims just to get him out of the newspapers. And during that three years, he wrote profusely about the importance of history, the role of education, and of course, the importance of the Naval War College as an institution for educating uh, practitioners about their profession. And these are ideas that are all being stolen by us Americans from the British and, and, and Germans and others. Uh, but to have the conversation is, is the strategic element in all of this. Now, for those of you who don't know who Sims is, he's the guy who got sent over to London in 1917 uh, almost by accident uh, or as a series of mistakes or nobody's really sure why, um, but I'll talk about that later. And he's sent to London before the American declaration of war on a secret mission. 
to establish ties with the Admiralty in the event that the United States declares war on Germany. Now, for context, this is the Zimmerman telegram happened in January of 1917, where the Germans suggested that they would support the Mexicans if they wanted Texas back. Uh, and the Germans even threw in some lines about supporting the Japanese if they wanted to take Hawaii and Alaska. Uh, and of course, Woodrow Wilson did not want to be part of the First World War, uh, which by 1917, the European powers were pretty much worn out. And so Woodrow Wilson really didn't want to get involved. Uh, but with the Zimmerman telegram, it looked like uh, there was no avoiding the war. So uh, in order to develop the sort of uh, connections that might be required in the event of war, they sent Sims. The problem here is they sent Sims over to London without a uniform. They told him, look, we're, we have not decided to, to have a, a declaration of war. So, you know, be discreet. Don't tell anybody you're there. You can say that you're an admiral. Technically, at the time, he had been selected uh, for promotion to admiral, but his date of promotion was still uh, forthcoming. And so technically, he's still a captain in the US Navy uh, when he gets to London, but without a uniform. And it's four days after the American declaration of war, Jellico, the first sea lord, says, Bill, where, where's your uniform? And Sims, of course, didn't have a uniform. And so uh, Jellicoe made arrangements special uh, for Sims to get a uniform made. And as you can see, there's the, uh, he went down to Savile Row. Stovall Mason's actually on Birmingham Street now. Um, they're still there though. And they had a uniform made up. And as you can see, he's, um, he's choosing to wear a US Navy Admiral's uniform. He was authorized to wear the rank of, of Admiral, but the rest of the United States Navy did not know that he had promoted to Admiral yet. So when he suddenly appears in the British newspapers as the commander of US Naval Forces Europe, um, that creates a huge controversy here in the United States. And ultimately Sims does become commander of US Naval Forces Europe and um, gets promoted to three-star rank during the war uh, within about two month period. This gentleman is Tracy Barrett Kittredge. Kittredge was working for the Bel Belgian relief effort and he's also a sort of an entity in British intelligence. Of course, with the American uh, passport before the American declaration of war, he's operating in Europe and he's talking with the Germans, he's going to Berlin, he's talking to the Kaiser. And then he'd come to London periodically and he'd meet with his friends, uh, Leicester Denniston and others and um, just over drinks, he would tell his British friends who he was talking to in, in Germany and what the Germans were up to. So is he a spy? I, maybe, um, not really. He's an American, he's neutral. Uh, but certainly the British were gathering information from him. And since he was already in London and he was friends with a lot of British people, he had attended Oxford University, by the way, um, he ended up becoming Admiral Sims's de facto intelligence officer. And it's Kittredge who is the link that connects British intelligence with the headquarters that Sims ends up developing during the First World War. It's a, it's a radical headquarters uh, from an American perspective in the sense that in the US Navy, uh, commanding ships at sea from, from a building ashore was just not done. Uh, the British are the ones who are influencing American perspectives on how to command warships at sea in the wireless age. And part of that discussion is Sir Julian Corbett, who's obviously operating in a far higher level in the British government, but he is influencing American approaches to command. And this idea of a historical branch uh, seems to be a really radical idea for, from Sims's point of view. Uh, by the winter of 1917, you have Captain Dudley Knox uh, joining the staff. And of course, Tracy Kittredge is already there serving as an intelligence officer. And history and intelligence are sort of uh, functions that are at the nexus of what was being done in that building known as the London flagship, uh, which the building is still there uh, and had served as uh, the American Naval Headquarters for uh, two world wars. Um, and that's where Sims is creating the new idea, what we call in the Navy today, uh, the, the Joint Force Maritime Component Commander, 
or, or C, which is Combined Force Maritime Components Commander. SIMS is the first one to do that. SIMS is also the first to hold nominal command of foreign warships during the First World War since George Washington. So SIMS is a really historic figure and it's all by essentially accident uh, in 1917, 1918. The bottom line is the US Navy was not configured for combined or joint operations. And so they're kind of making it up as they go with a lot of help from the British. Now, the history of, of the London flagship headquarters is compiled by Dudley Knox and Tracy Kittredge, and they're inspired by the example set by Corbett and the historical branch. And so they, they do actually start compiling publications that try and capture the applicable lessons of that First World War experience, and they bring all the records back here to Newport, and they produce a series. Uh, you can see this one, the American Naval Planning Section, this is number seven in the series. And if you read it, it's all of the memoranda that were produced by the planning section in Sims's headquarters. And it's the planning section that serves as the basis for American naval thinking on the, the use of headquarters in a strategic way to drive operations at sea and all the way down to the tactical level. And it's that experience of the First World War that really sets the US Navy up for uh, what comes in the second. I couldn't help myself. I, I had to keep this slide. <clears throat> On the 4th of July, 1918, uh, the King uh, came to a, a, a baseball match that was held in, in central London. More than 70,000 uh, people were there. And what I always like to say is um, with the American Revolution and George Washington and all that, um, the, the actual victory uh, happened uh, on the 4th of July, 1918, when uh, King George signed the surrender document, which happens to be that baseball. Uh, that's meant to be a joke, just so you know. Uh, but there he is, uh, shaking hand uh, with Sims standing uh, proudly uh, with the captain of the Navy baseball team. And we all know that the Navy beat the Army during this, this great ball game on the 4th of July, 1918. And that's Mike McNally of the Boston Red Sox, who happened to be uh, given yeoman's rank with the specific job of playing baseball for the Navy, because we can't let the Army win, of course. Okay, so we've gotten through the 19th century, we're, we're into the First World War period, uh, and we're getting into that interwar period. What's this all about? Well, the history of the British Empire is the inspiration for what the Americans start to see as a global mission in the maritime arena. And it's service with the British during the First World War that gives the Americans some practical ideas about how to use their Navy in the future. Uh, I always like to talk about Ernie King because I've spent so much time on him and it was the subject of my dissertation at King's College London with Andrew. Uh, but one of the interesting things that I picked up in my research was during the Grand Fleet maneuvers in 1918, uh, King was there as a, as a mere commander watching uh, David Beatty maneuvering his ships in the Grand Fleet maneuvers and out of the mist, uh, Admiral Sturdee surprised Beatty. And according to King, Beatty cinched his hat down in, in a jaunty sort of angle, stuck his hands in the pocket and said to the, everybody on the, on the bridge that great, great job, we won, great job, excellent work. And of course, King said, well, didn't he lose? He just lost. And um, so King adopted that look in his career. Uh, whenever he wanted to look victorious, he, he would cinch his cap down like Beatty, stick his hands in the pocket and, and adopt the Beatty look. And that, I, I have this from Dudley Knox's letter to Samuel Elliott Morrison, uh, who asked about the picture on the right, why is King sort of doing that? And Knox responded, well, that's King doing his Beatty. Okay. So the historical section, this is the good part. When Sims came home from London, that experience, he reopened the Naval War College here in Newport. They wanted that it was closed during the First World War and they basically wanted to keep it closed. And Sims said, no, we have got to learn lessons from that experience of the First World War. And so he got into a huge fight with the Secretary of the Navy, Josephus Daniels on the question of education and the role of history in uh, 
examining what those lessons might be from history that can be applied for the future. And here you see Sims with his new staff. You see Professor Wilson over there carrying that professor rank um, in, in, in the lineup of, of the staff at the War College. And you can see uh, this is the first class after the First World War. What's going on behind the scenes at the lower levels of rank are studies about the role of education. And in 1919, Sims actually organizes uh, a board with the help of, of Admiral Mayo, who's another figure in all of this, uh, comprised of Ernest King, uh, uh, William S. Pye, and Dudley Knox. And they examine the question, what, what's the function of education? Why is it worth our money to spend money on education in the Navy? And one of the radical conclusions that they came up with was essentially that the highest ranking admiral is only educated to the lowest commission grade. What they mean there is the only actual education that uh, naval officers have received is at the Naval Academy, which only produces ensigns. And so all these admirals who are running around with all this rank really haven't been educated to think in strategic terms. And so they, what they end up saying is that your average admiral is not educated to be an admiral. Uh, that's a radical statement at the time, uh, 1919, but it's all part of this sort of mix of trying to learn lessons from the First World War experience. And what's happening after the First World War is people like Josephus Daniels, the politician uh, and the Secretary of the Navy, basically he's trying to write the history of the war in a very positive way. Uh, you do see Franklin Roosevelt, his assistant secretary of the Navy, probably uh, with a knife in his hands behind Josephus Daniels, um, and uh, basically sort of whispering in the ear of Daniels that, you know, Sims has a point here, and uh, we need to actually take a very cold and objective look at what the experience of the First World War was all about, and we have to be honest with each other about it. And you see the cartoon of Sims just shooting holes in the narrative of the heroic narrative that Josephus Daniels and the propagandists were trying to push. Um, Josephus Daniels' book, by the way, is the one depicted on, on the left-hand side, Our Navy at War. It's a very heroic portrayal of what the Navy achieved in the First World War context. Uh, the victory at sea is also sort of a fluffy, positive, view from, from Admiral Sims's point of view, uh, saying, yeah, we achieved a lot of great things, but at the same time, you know, there's still a lot of lessons to be learned. And we had a great baseball game, by the way. He actually makes pretty big mention of it as a strategic aspect of Anglo-American collaboration in the Victory at Sea. Uh, but you can't read Victory at Sea without reading the naval lessons of the Great War, as written by Tracy Barrett Kittredge, who's inspired by Corbett in the historical section. And he's working with Knox here at the Naval War College to basically produce that book. And if you read Naval Lessons of the Great War in conjunction with the Victory at Sea, you get a pretty full picture about the attitude within the US Navy about Josephus Daniels. Uh, the Naval Lessons of the Great War is essentially an indictment of the US Naval Department and the failures of the United States Navy in the First World War. So it's all part of this mix that we're talking about. How do we learn from the past? How do we apply it? We're practitioners, we're not historians, but we need historians to help us understand what the real lessons are of the past. And Sims is just making all kinds of trouble for the politicians. The one thing I would say is Franklin Roosevelt has a role in this whole dialogue behind the scenes. And um, one of the great sort of things that I've discovered in my research is a headline from the, the New York Times where Franklin Roosevelt says, you know, I, I supported Sims the whole time. And if anybody ever found out the things that I did when I was Assistant Secretary of the Navy under Josephus Daniels, I would go to prison for 999 years. <laughs> so Corbett does loom large in setting the example for the Americans to use history in that post First World War period, learning the theor theoretical study of history. Now, Sims brings these ideas back. He's corresponding with Corbett 
and actually out of his own pocket purchases as many copies of some principles of maritime strategy as he can possibly get his hands on. And he comes back from the, the experience of the First World War and he says, okay, guys, we're going to be reading this stuff and um, you're, you're going to get a heavy dose of Corbett. And of course, naval practitioners, when they see books being inflicted upon them, and I, you, you're telling me I have to read all this, you know, that this is what I have to do. I thought I was going to go, go golfing here. I mean, it's Newport, for God's sakes. I want to go sailing. Uh, why do I have to read all these books? Uh, the, the Sims curriculum is sort of a shock uh, to naval practitioners who attended the college during the interwar period. And there is a historical section generating new curriculum that is a direct uh, uh, model based upon that which Corbett had uh, that was established here at the Naval War College. And they're generating new historical studies of uh, past experiences and they're trying to find lessons. Now with all those books and all these new historical studies, Naval practitioners, they don't wanna read that stuff. It, it just takes too much time. So what do they do? They get together, they say, you read this book, you read that book, and they all sort of read different books and they put together paragraph length summaries of, of the books. And one of the great, best documents we have in our collections here at the college is the extracts from the books that Sims told you I was supposed to read, but they didn't wanna you know, bother uh, taking the time to do so. But the, the summary is actually pretty interesting in the sense of uh, looking at the lessons that the practitioners do find in reading these different uh, volumes. Wargaming has always been part of the Naval War College experience, and that, of course, is influenced by Fred T. Jane and all of that that I talked about earlier. But uh, the Battle of Jutland becomes a fixture of the Naval War College curriculum. So the way it works in the interwar period is the Battle of Jutland is the second study that you do after you've studied Nelson. So you get Trafalgar, you get Jutland, and then they're also looking at the Dardanelles campaign, which uh, are, are very interesting studies. If you read the different theses written by uh, practitioners who came through the college in the 20s and 30s. And it's a lot of British influence uh, in the curriculum here at the college. Dudley Knox goes on to become a historian in his own right, sort of picking up the cross where Mahan left off and trying to use history as a sort of a way of making political points and at the same time advancing uh, the educational mission <clears throat> of the US Navy for practitioners. So uh, Eclipse of American Sea Power is a, an interesting uh, study of the post-war effort to build a United Nations Navy. And basically Knox is saying, you know, let's be careful about uh, some of these navies. Uh, we can't afford to consign ourselves to other nations' uh, interests, but at the same time, we have to reserve uh, a, a place for ourselves at the table uh, in order to be a, a true maritime power. Later on, he writes this book called The Naval Genius of George Washington. Uh, what's interesting about that book is the naval genius of George Washington. Uh, I thought George Washington was a general, but what Knox demonstrates is that George Washington would not have won the American Revolution. In fact, he sort of alleges that he didn't win the American Revolution. Uh, the British just got sort of tired of it. Uh, but what Washington did do is he worked with the French and was able to use sea power to achieve his ends uh, over a certain timeline. And that's an interesting, interesting book to read. So that's Chester Nimitz when he came here to the Naval War College. And he wrote a thesis on tactics in which he just focused on the Battle of Jutland and pulls out all of these interesting perspectives. You know, this is applied history at its finest. And I would encourage all uh, who are listening, if you, if you wanna read new stuff about Second World War thinkers, uh, go into their theses that they wrote when they were more junior, when they came to the Naval War College and working within uh, the context of applied history as provided by the historical section here at, in Newport. Uh, Ernie King is the guy I've spent a lot of time writing a book about, which I'm trying to find a publisher for, just so you know, if 
if there's any publishers out there, <laughs> it's a good book. Uh, Ernie King came through the college three times. Um, he graduated first in 1916, then again, correspondence course, 1924, and then again, 1933. King is what I would call a true believer in studying history and applied approaches to history. And when he becomes the commander in chief US Navy, he actually spends a lot of time on how we can learn from the lessons of the past as we're framing future operations. Another character in this whole mix is Hector C. Bywater, who's writing these fictions that Ernie King is, di he's devouring these, these, these books that are produced by Hector Bywater. And one of the interesting ones is Strange Intelligence, which is all about intelligence and tracking enemy submarines and all of that sort of thing, the First World War. And Strange Intelligence is a book that does influence Ernie King's thinking when he organizes the American Combat Intelligence Division in 1943. So here's some more British influences upon American thinking. Uh, another book by Bywater, of course, The Great Pacific War, published in 1925, in which Bywater predicts the role of aircraft carriers, uh, the role of submarines, the importance of logistics, uh, 1925. He basically describes the, the future uh, as it unfolds. Of course, he didn't know he was doing that. But one of his avid readers is none other than Ernie King. And King actually tries out some of these ideas during the fleet problems of the interwar period. Uh, Robert Heinlein is the communications officer. He's a science fiction writer who goes on to be a, a writer of, of great note, who served on board the Lexington when Ernest King, during a fleet problem, uh, demonstrated the vulnerability of, of uh, fixed bases ashore when King bombed simulated the bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1932. Heinlein later uses that experience uh, in his writing uh, on science fiction, uh, using his experiences on board Lexington as the inspiration for those science fictions. Okay, so we've gotten through now the 1920s and 30s and we're getting into that period of the Second World War. And we all know that Adolf Hitler was somebody who was you know, bent on having a war and Winston Churchill does rise to uh, uh, regain you know, his uh, role at the Admiralty and of course uh, goes on to become prime minister. And, and Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill start this dialogue between each other about the transatlantic relationship. They had met in the First World War actually and Roosevelt wrote that he didn't really like him all, Churchill all that much. But uh, in the interest of collaboration after the United States warship Panay was sunk in Chinese waters, uh, Roosevelt said, okay, let's, let's start the dialogue again. Let's start talking to people like Winston Churchill and let's see what we can do to mitigate the prospect of a global com conflagration. And this does culminate in the Atlantic Charter of August of 1941, just a few months before Pearl Harbor. Uh, so the, what we have are the early sort of uh, foundations for what would evolve in the Second World War context. During that Atlantic Charter Conference uh, between Churchill and Roosevelt on board the Augusta, the flagship of Ernest J. King, who was the Commander-in-Chief Atlantic Fleet at the time. Here we see Stark standing behind Churchill. He's the Chief of Naval Operations. Uh, during those meetings, Winston Churchill said, we have to have a community of English-speaking peoples. We have to restore the order of the British Empire. Franklin Roosevelt said, yeah, that, that's sure, that may be um, what we really need to do is to have a United Nations, not a British Empire. The age of empire is over. And, you know, the Americans are sort of listening to their policymakers, sort of friendly discussions about this future. And, and the Americans are saying, well, my boss, wants to have a United Nations, we're not gonna do British Empire, we're gonna do something else in the event that we get involved with another war. Uh, another figure still working on the scene is Tracy Kittredge, who's over in Europe working for Herbert Hoover, of all people, um, as part of the Red Cross uh, efforts uh, based in, in Switzerland. And he's also gathering information about what's going on in Europe and he's feeding that information to Captain Dudley Knox, who's now working in the Navy Department in the Office of Naval Intelligence as a historian, 
And Dudley Knox is also serving as an advisor to the Chief of Naval Operations, Harold Stark. So Kittredge is another figure who's still in this sort of big mix of uh, European and American dialogue about what's going on in the global stage. And, and they're all historians, at least at heart, uh, if not uh, by trade. During that period before Pearl Harbor, Franklin Roosevelt commissioned Dudley Knox, gave him a lot of money to produce a series of histories, official histories of the quasi war with France. Now Knox wanted to do an official history of the First World War and Franklin Roosevelt said, no, go back to the age of sail. I wanna talk about quasi wars. Now what Roosevelt is trying to do is he's trying to use history as a means to communicate to the American taxpayer about what he proposes to do with the United States Navy. In other words, he's going to use the US Navy as the buffer to stay out of the, the global uh, situation in, in Europe and Asia. Of course, Japanese had invaded uh, China before that. And the, of course, Adolf Hitler is making noise in Europe. And what Roosevelt is trying to do is use history to set the stage for articul articulating a policy that is built around the notion of naval neutrality. And the quasi-war and Dudley Knox's efforts to put together those histories, first published in 37, all the way up to 1939, uh, it's part of Roosevelt's naval strategy. Now, I will tell you that the Pearl Harbor attack was truly a surprise for the Americans. They were not really set up for that attack because the joint services were not talking to each other. Franklin Roosevelt knew that Pearl Harbor was vulnerable, but everybody was surprised. And probably the most surprised person was none other than Carl Dönitz over there in Germany, uh, because the Japanese also didn't bother to tell him that they were going to do this. And we all know that this is what finally does get the United States into the Second World War, the Pearl Harbor attack. And immediately after the Pearl Harbor attack, Winston does come to the United States for the Arcadia Conference. And it's, it's a follow on in many respects to the Atlantic Conference uh, that had just taken place in August. Uh, and they all get together at the White House in Washington DC during Christmas. And they're batting around these ideas. Do we restore the British Empire? Who's gonna be in charge? Royal Navy, are you in the lead for Europe? Uh, US Navy, are you in the lead in, in the Pacific? What, you know, how are we gonna do this? And, and basically everybody's sort of fighting with each other uh, over Christmas time about how things are gonna work. Harold Stark is still the chief of naval operations Ernest King is still the commander of the Atlantic fleet. So during these discussions, it becomes clear that Harold Stark has another role to play. But Roosevelt doesn't want to let him leave in the aftermath of Pearl Harbor as CNO, so Chief of Naval Operations. So there's sort of a timeline that is established during the Arcadia Conference about how things would evolve uh, in the American camp. And one of the things that they do create just out of necessity is the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Arcadia Conference. Ernest King becomes the Chief of Naval Operations by uh, March of 1942. Uh, he is promoted to the uh, role of Commander in Chief US Fleet, which is known in the Navy at the time as Sinkus. And King said after Pearl Harbor, I don't wanna be called Sinkus. And so he changed the title to Comanche. So King holds both the, the roles of, of CNO and Comanche by March of 1942. Uh, George Marshall is the Army Chief of Staff. And so basically the, the, the American variant of the, the British Joint Chiefs is basically two people. It's Ernest King and George Marshall. To help facilitate all this, the former CNO, Harold Stark is sent to London to reestablish the American headquarters in London. So what you see is this sort of Anglo-American uh, transatlantic network of command and history is a, a fundamental component of this. We all know that history is essentially unclassified. And it's Harold Stark who brings Tracy Kittredge back onto active service to help him reorganize the intelligence division of the headquarters in Europe 
so that they can support the dialogue that's going on in Washington between the Army and Navy. And so there's a lot of interesting figures. And you're, there you can see uh, right after Harold Stark arrives uh, in London in, in June of 42, you can see uh, Tracy Kittredge following him uh, behind. So, you know, by the summer of 1942, we, we essentially have the Combined Chiefs of Staff uh, on the American side, we have the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, William Leahy uh, becomes an ex officio member as the uh, Chief of Staff to the President. Hap Arnold is also uh, a figure, he's an Air Force guy. But the, the, the standing members of the American Joint Chiefs are, are Ernest King and George Marshall. And that's, that's a nuance that a lot of historians since the Second World War have not uh, really uh, recognized and addressed. But by 1942, 1943, we're talking about the construction of a United Nations, not the restoration of the British Empire, at least from the American point of view. Uh, I'm sure uh, we all know that Churchill had other ideas uh, in the back of his mind. Now, what's really important about combined operations, history, the role of intelligence, is through those studies of the interwar period, the influence of history all the way back to the 19th century. Don't forget, Ernest King is born right after the American Civil War. So the way he thinks about the world is, is completely different than the way we think about the world today uh, in the 1943 context. And he recalls the experience of the First World War, working with the British. They operated differently. They had different communication systems. They had different ways of doing business. And he gives a speech in 1943 where he says, look, unity of command is not what we want. What we want is unity of effort. And it's this idea of unity of effort. He's pulling this out straight out of his studies of, of Corbett and Mahan. And he's saying, we need unity of effort. Now, I'll help you if you help me. Obviously, if I, I'll give you gas. If I can give you gas, I'll give you ammunition. But in the end, the Royal Navy, the Royal Australian Navy, Royal Canadian Navy, you all operate differently than, than we do, and we're in the middle of a fight. So let's just do unity of effort. And it's an interesting idea because he is drawing from his own studies of history and his own experience to make these types of uh, speeches. Um, in 1943, Ernest King reestablishes something uh, that is based upon the historical section that was uh, earlier time modeled after Corbett's, and he calls it the Battle Studies Group. And they start producing histories of recent actions, and they recruit all these historians uh, to the Navy Department. So Sam Elliott Morrison is sort of part of that mix, but Robert Greenall Albion and their students, uh, people like Philip Lundeberg and others, are brought into the Navy, given commissions, and their sole purpose in life is to produce histories uh, to support American naval commanders uh, in making decisions. So here we see uh, Ernest King and Dudley Knox harnessing that sort of nexus between history and intelligence, and they're using it in a very practical way in the heat of combat of the Second World War. And I think the Battle Studies Group, the, the historical section uh, of the First World War period, are, are both examples that, at least today at the Naval War College, we're trying to draw uh, perspective from in, in what we're doing today with, with what we're calling the Hattendorf Center. Uh, but I'll save that round for later. Um, this is a lot of uh, pictures for you, but just to give you a sense of uh, the, the volume of uh, product that was produced during the Second World War by the Battle Studies Group historical section it changes a little bit during the war. Uh, Tracy Kittredge is part of that, uh, Dudley Knox, and of course the guy in the lower right-hand side is a guy named Commodore Richard S. Bates, who becomes part of the staff here at the Naval War College uh, after the Second World War uh, to produce new histories about the past all the way back to uh, the Civil War period for the purposes of educating the United States Navy the applied historical purpose for global maritime operations in both peace and war. So uh, history is seen as a fundamental element in uh, 
intelligence at the college. Now, I was going to talk at length about the Battle of Lady Gulf uh, in 1944, but I, I don't wanna kill you too much with, with detail. The bottom line is, at the Battle of Lady Gulf in 1944, William Halsey had those little blue books that I showed you earlier. He's reading those. Those are being sent out to the ships. He's reading the lessons learned. And uh, there he is at the Battle of Lady Gulf in 1944. He also has the Japanese plan in front of him. And his intelligence officer, Mike Cheek, who served in Queenstown uh, with William uh, Halsey during the First World War, Mike Cheek is his intelligence officer who briefs Admiral Halsey on the Japanese plan. So Halsey knows what the Japanese are doing. He knows that there's a, J uh, a Japanese decoy force. He also was told that if he has an opportunity to wipe out the Japanese Navy, that he should take it. So what's this all about? When he came to the Naval War College, he wrote a thesis about the American Civil War amphibious operations of the American Civil War. He also wrote a thesis about the Dardanelles campaign. And one of the things that he recognized in studying the Dardanelles campaign is that in the event that the amphibious beachhead is, is threatened by an enemy force, you want to engage that enemy force as far out as you can and wither them down before they can attack the amphibious force. So when Halsey decides to attack what he knows is the Japanese decoy force, he makes a very sound military decision. It's a measured decision based upon the information he had. A lot of historians, this is the, the Sean Connery moment, you know, uh, you know, Halsey was wrong and all of that. Um, actually, Sean Connery is wrong. Uh, Halsey made a very good decision, I think, in the context of the moment at the Battle of Lady Gulf. And, and that decision was based upon his studies of past wars and recent uh, experience in the Second World War. So, you know, I'm, I'm coming to a close here, but the bottom line is, if you're going to win future wars, you're gonna to have to be able to do this. Um, what we're gonna to have to do in the future is to be able to go on the high seas and operate and be able to take islands in order to have sailors on the beach enjoying themselves in the sun. Uh, and if, if history is any guide to that, uh, this is um, the opportunity for us to sort of think about how history influenced American strategy uh, during the Second World War uh, and how the British uh, school influenced the American school uh, in, in the aftermath of the American Civil War. So with that, Alan, thank you so much for the time. I hope I didn't bore you with uh, too so many details. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sure everybody's clapping in their own way uh, at home. Many, many thanks uh, for that. And that was